Now moving to the next lesson, that is the Mughal Empire. So the Mughal Empire was founded by Babur and Babur ruled from 1526 to 1530. We already dealt with Babur in the Lodis. So let's deal it again. So Babur's original name was Zahiruddin Muhammad and he belonged to two great families that is Taimur from his father's side. We already saw about Taimur who came to India and invaded India also. And Chengiz Khan, we already know about them. They were residing in the Central Asia. They were the Mongols. And Chengiz Khan on the mother's side. So he had two great blood. And then his father was Umar Sheikh Mirza, who was the ruler of Farhana. So after the death of Umar Sheikh Mirza, Babur succeeded as the ruler of Farhana. But later he lost Farhana. And after that, he started wandering to many places and finally he captured Kabul from his uncle. So what happened was, Babur's father was Umar Sheikh Mizra. He was the ruler of Farhana. Later, Babur got Fargana when Umar Sheikh Mizra died. And then he lost it also. And he started wandering for some time and captured Kabul from his uncles. And then Babur's conquest to India included from 1519 to 1523. But all that was a failure. So during his conquest, who and all was there in India? There were five Muslim rule in India and two Hindu rule in India. The five Muslim rule include the Sultans of Delhi, Gujarat, Malwa, Bengal and Deccan. And the Hindu rule included the Rana Sangha of Mewar and the Vijayanagar Empire. So he has to defeat all these people to enter into India. And what happened? He took a break of one year and started again in 1526 when Daulat Khan Lodi invited Babur to India to kill Ibrahim Lodi. And that happened in the first battle of Panipat which took place in 1526. This was a decisive battle fought between Babur and Ibrahim Lodi. Babur won because of his cavalry and artillery. And the battle took place in Delhi and Ibrahim Lodi was killed. So this was the first battle of Panipat. And later, after capturing Delhi from Ibrahim Lodi, he sent his son Humayun to conquer Agra. Because Delhi and Agra was the two important places. And Humayun went and captured Agra too. And Babur declared himself as the emperor of Hindustan. So the first emperor of Hindustan, that is the first great Muslim rule, started with Babur. And then after the first battle of Panipat, took place the battle of Kanua near Agra. In 1527, the preceding year itself, that is 1526 was first battle of Panipat and 1527, it was the battle of Kanwa. So we already saw that Rana Sangha of Mewar was in India, that is under the Hindu rule. So he and Babur fought a decisive battle. Rana Sangha was also a great warrior, but he lost in the battle of Kanwa. And Babur won in this battle and assumed the title Ghazi. So under the battle of Panipat, he assumed himself to be the emperor of Hindustan and under the battle of Kanua, he assumed himself the title Ghazi. And Babur died at the age of 47 in Agra. And now moving to the estimation, that is Babur's estimation. He is a great scholar in Arabic and Persian language. So his memories include the tuzuk e babri that is his autobiography, which is written in his mother tongue, Turki. And then he is a great naturalist and has an account of the Indian flora and fauna. So we are done with Babur. Now moving to Humayun. So under the Mughal rule, we have the strong rulers as well as the weak rulers. Under the strong rule, we have the Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Sajahan, and lastly the Aurangzeb. So these people were considered to be the great rulers. And after them, who and all came were considered to be the weak rulers. And these weak rulers are dealt in modern India. We'll deal with Baba, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan and, and Aurangzeb in medieval India. So about Humayun, Humayun started ruling from 1530 to 1540. He is the eldest son of Babur and his name denotes that he is a fortunate person. But unfortunately, he is not a fortunate person. So what happened? Humayun had three other brothers along with him named Kamran, Askari and Hindal. So what happened? Humayun divided the kingdom between them. That is, he gave some part of the kingdom to them also. So under that, Kamran was given Kabul and Kandahar, Askari was given Sambal, Hindal was given Alwar. So this was considered a great blunder done by Humayun. And Humayun was busy fighting with the Afghans in the east. So after dividing the kingdom within his brothers, he was fighting in the east with the Afghans. 
and what happened in the meantime bahadur shah of gujarat so bahadur shah is another person that is he is from gujarat he is marching towards delhi to capture delhi so meanwhile when he was fighting with afghans in the east he concluded the fight with a treaty with sher shah known as sher khan we'll deal about sher shah later so he concluded a treaty with whom sher khan or sher shah and then he came back to gujarat captured gujarat and appointed one of his brother askari as the governor of gujarat now what happened again this bahadur shah captured gujarat from askari so askari was set by humayun as the governor of the gujarat but again bahadur shah will come and capture gujarat from askari now sher shah became powerful in the east because we saw humayun concluded a treaty with the sher khan or sher shah in the east and returned back to gujarat now sher shah in the meantime he will become powerful in the east and then the battle of chausa will happen in 1539 so between sher shah and humayun sher shah will win over humayun and humayun will flee away from that place and then humayun will later go to agra where his brothers are residing and he'll negotiate with his brothers to fight against whom sher shah but his brothers won't cooperate with humayun and later the battle of bilgram or the battle of kanuj will take place in 1540 so in 1539 battle of chausa will happen and in 1540 battle of kanuj will happen in which again sher shah and humayun will fight and humayun will lose again and he will go exile for 15 years that is he will not be known to any of them he will go hide off so 15 years he will be under exile and then now moving to the sir dynasty which ruled from 1540 to 1555 that is an estimation of 15 years so the sir dynasty was founded by sher shah sher shah's original name was farid and he was the son of hasan khan and farid served under the afghan ruler of bihar so farid was not a ruler actually he served under the afghan ruler of bihar so this ruler that is the afghan ruler gave him the title sher khan for his bravery and we already saw under the battle of chausa which took place in 1540 between humayun and sher khan he became the ruler of delhi who sher khan became the ruler of delhi and now sher shah suri's rule which lasted from 1540 to 1545 only 5 years but those 5 years were very very efficient now after coming to the rule he started wars with the rajputs and extended his empire and then his kingdom was an estimation of the whole of north india except some places like assam nepal kashmir and gujarat then think and see how big is his empire in north india then moving to his administration the favorite part under sher shah is his administration a beautiful administration so he divided the central government into various sectors and departments also that is diwan e wazir we already saw about all these uh, departments in the delhi sultanate period so it will be kind of same only so diwan e wazir is given to the wazir of prime minister and he will deal with the revenue and the financial matters and then diwan e aids is for army diwan e rasalat is for foreign minister and diwan e insha is for communication so all these ministries were set up under the central government and his empire was divided into 47 sarkars we already saw about this that the vijayanagar empire was divided into mandalas stalas nadus and gramas same way his empire was also divided into sarkars parganas and the administrative units like iktas so under the sarkars that is 47 sarkars it was divided into in that we have the chief shikdar who took care of the law and then we have the chief munsif who is called as the judge so these two people administered the sarkas that is each sarkar was administered by the shikdar and the munsif and then moving to the sarkas sarkas is further divided into parganas under parganas there are administrative units that is the shikdar who took care of the military over here and we have the amin who took care of the land revenue we have the fourth dar who took care of the treasury and we have the karkuns who took care of the accountants so all these people come under the parganas and lastly this parganas were further divided into administrative units that is smaller administrative units called as the iktas and under sher shah every land was properly surveyed so under the rule of sher shah the land was surveyed right it was surveyed and divided into three categories that is good middle and bad category 
and the land was divided into one third to the state that is one third of the produce from the farmer should be given to the state we already saw in various uh, kingdoms that one by sixth part and all was given but under shersha one by third part should be given to the treasury or the kingdom in parts of cash or produce so anything any way they can give so his revenue reforms increased the revenue of the state that is it increased the treasury and then he introduced silver coins called as dam which was in circulation until 1835 we already saw iltutmish also introduced silver tankas and the same way this silver coins was introduced by shersha called dam which was in circulation until 1835 and then four important highways was laid down during the period of sersha in order for proper communication so what are the four important highways sonagon to sindh agra to burampur jodhpur to chitor and lahore to multan so these were the four important highways and rest houses were also built near the highways for the travelers and police were appointed in order to reduce the crime rates and then branding of horses called as bug where alauddin khilji introduced the bug called as the branding of horses that same method was taken by shersha also and then now coming to the estimation of shersha shersha is a pious muslim and he is tolerant towards other religion also so he employed hindus in high postings and then he is a patron of art and architecture so he built a new city on the banks of river yamuna so on the banks of river yamuna a new city was built but now only the purana kila and the mosque is surviving so in the banks of river yamuna there is a city and in that city he built the purana kila and a mosque near purana kila but now only these two things are surviving other buildings are not surviving and then malik mohammad jayasi we already saw about this man jayasi so he his full name is malik mohammad jayasi who wrote the padmavat during his reign you already saw that the book padmavat was written by jayasi his full name is malik mohammad jayasi and he lived during the period of shersha and then his successors were weak that is sherkan's successor was weak and they ruled until 1555 and later humayun came and took the throne so this is a brief about sher shah or sher khan now moving to humayun humayun ruled again from 1555 to 1556 that is only 6 months he ruled what happened in that period was humayun married hamida banu begum on his way to sindh so humayun fled away after the battle right so while moving to sindh he married whom hamida banu begum and what happened they resided or they stayed in amar court that is that amar court is ruled by a hindu king named as rana prasad so under them they were living and akbar was born in amar court in 1542 so the son of humayun is akbar he was born in 1542 in amar court and then humayun left to iran and asked help from the rulers in iran and he came back from iran and defeated his brothers in north india that is Kamran and Askari was defeated because they didn't help him in defeating Sersha earlier and then later when he came Sersha died and the Sir dynasty was under the decline period and in 1555 Humayun defeated the Afghans that is the Sur dynasty he defeated all the people in the Sur dynasty and took the kingdom from them so later what happened was after taking the kingdom from these people he fell from a staircase that is a new library was built in his kingdom and while reading the book he fell from the stairs and he died in 1556 that's why he is called as unfortunate because after capturing the kingdom after 15 years in within 6 months he died and then he is a learned student of math astronomy astrology and he also practiced painting and poetry writing in persian language the next important king is akbar who ruled from 1556 to 16 not 5 so after the death of humayun akbar started ruling but then he was very young to rule so one of the greatest monarch of india was akbar and delhi was seized by afghans because humayun died and delhi was seized by afghans so the commander in chief for the afghans was himu now moving to the second battle of panipat the second battle of panipat was fought between himu and bairam khan 
Bairam Khan is the guardian of Akbar because Akbar was too small to fight and hence Bairam Khan was the commander in chief in the Mughal army and Hemo was the commander in chief for the Afghan army. So these two people fought very decisively in the battle but then Hemo was at the victory point but then an arrow striked on his eye and he went unconscious and all his army fled away. And then the victory was towards the Bairam Khan side, that is the Mughals, that is Akbar won in the battle. And the second battle of Panipat was fought in 1556. And Akbar later ordered Bairam Khan to leave to Mecca. And on the way to Mecca, Bairam Khan was killed. And lately, Akbar extended his empire from Agra to Gujarat and from Gujarat to Bengal. And during his rule, the northwestern frontier was protected. And then moving to relationship with the Rajputs. So you can very well understand the rule of Akbar from the movie Jodha Akbar. So definitely have a watch on the movie. And then moving to the relationship with the Rajputs. He married the Rajput princess that is the daughter of Raja Baramal. Then the Rajput served the Mughals for four generations. So he actually said we don't need to fight. That is we don't need to involve in a war and don't need to lose a lot of life. And hence, he followed a tolerant policy towards all. So, he, all the Rajputs served under the Mughals. That is, they started from Akbar until four generations. And then, Raja Bahwan Das and Raja Man Singh of the Rajput was given senior post under, under the Mughal rule. And then, the very important battle called as the Battle of Haldigati, which took place in 1576 between Rana Pratap Singh and Man Singh. Actually, some of the Rajput kings didn't submit to Akbar and hence he waged war against them. Under that, the Rana Pratap Singh of Mewar didn't submit and hence over here, the Rana Pratap Singh and on the Akbar side, we saw Man Singh was given senior post. So, he fought for Akbar and then won the battle of Haldigati in 1576. And then Akbar abolished the pilgrimage tax called as the Jizya. So we have already dealt with Jizya under the Delhi Sultanate rule. Now what is happening? Akbar is abolishing the tax Jizya. And then coming to the Akbar's religious policy, Akbar followed the Sufi saints and followed his tutor Abdul Latif. So we already saw under Sufism, Akbar followed all the deals under the Sufism or the Bhakti movement. And he followed his tutor that is Abdul Latif. At the beginning, Akbar was a very pious Muslim person and later, after marrying Jodha Bai, that is the daughter of Raja Barhamal, he became very lenient towards the religious policy. And then he married Jodha Bai of Amber, right? At that time only, he abolished Jizya, that is the pilgrimage tax in 1562. And then in 1575, he ordered the construction of Ibadat Khana, that is the house of worship. That is, people from any religion can come to Ibadat Khana, sit and discuss about the religious matters. And then in his new capital only, he ordered the construction of Ibadat Khana. In the new capital of Akbar was Fatehpur Shikri. So, Ibadat Khana is an important place of worship that was ordered to construction in 1575. And then the very important point to be noted down is in 1582 he introduced his new religion called as Dini Ilahi or Divine Faith. He took all the good points from every religion and included in Dini Ilahi. And people from all religions were welcomed into Dini Ilahi. But Akbar had only 15 followers in Dini Ilahi, and after Akbar's death, the religion started declining. And very important point to be noted down is Akbar didn't force anyone to come inside Dini Ilahi. It was on their own voluntary action that you can join Dini Ilahi or come out of Dini Ilahi. Now coming to the land revenue system under Akbar, Raja Thodar Mall was considered to be the backbone of the land revenue system under the Mughals, specifically under Akbar. So his land revenue system was called as Zaib or the Bandobas system. So the land revenue system under Raja Todar Mall is called as Zaib or Bandoba system. Actually, Raja Todar Mall, right, he served under Shersha also. Then he was later incorporated into the land revenue system under the Mughals. And then this Bandoba system was further upgraded to the Dahsala system uh, in 1580. 
under the system raja todermol right introduced a uniform land measurement so all the land was uniformly measured under the raja todermol system of daksala system and the revenue was collected according to the yield based on the last 10 years so last 10 years was taken and the yield was calculated in each year and the revenue was calculated accordingly and then the land was divided like so we saw under the sershas land revenue system the land was measured and the land was divided into good medium and bad three ways but under this land revenue system it is divided into four ways so what are the four ways the first way is the poolage second is the parauti third one is the chachar and the fourth one is the banjar so under the poolage system every year the land would be measured and the yield would be calculated under the parauti once in two years it will be measured and calculated under the chachar once in three to four years and under banjar five or more years and people have to pay the land revenue system in terms of cash so all the land revenue system they should pay in terms of what cash and then now coming to the most important system called as the mansabdari system this mansabdari system was introduced by akbar so under this system every officer was assigned a rank so every officer under the mughals or under akbar was given ranks and then the lowest rank is 10 the highest rank was 5000 which was given to the nobles so what is the lowest rank 10 highest rank is 5000 that is given to the nobles and then the princess of the royal blood received even higher ranks so we saw this rank system right given by the king so this rank is divided into two more types. the first one is the jat and the second one is the sabar so what is a jar jat is a rank given on the personal status of a person so they'll take you they'll assign you and then they'll give you rank based on your personal status that is called as jar then what is called as sabar under sabar number of cavalry men to be maintained by a person so each person should maintain the cavalry men that is the horses so under this under the sabar at least two horses a person should maintain so if you are a person you should maintain at least two horses and then this rank is not hereditary very important to be noted down so if your father is attaining a rank you won't have the same rank when your father dies so you have to earn your ranks so this rank is not hereditary and then all appointments promotions and dismissal were directly made by the emperor that is it was made by akbar so under the rank system the appointments the promotion and dismissal will be made by the emperor now we've done with akbar moving to jahangir jahangir ruled from 1605 to 1627 he is called as prince salim that is jahangir means the conqueror of world so prince salim was called as jahangir jahangir means conqueror of the world his rule was full of rebellions because his son that is kushro revolted against him and later he was imprisoned they say that Kushro's two eyes was taken out and then he was imprisoned. And then on that time, Kushro was supported by the fifth Sikh Guru to revolt against his father. The fifth Sikh Guru was Guru Arjun Dev and Jahangir captured Guru Arjun Dev and cut off his head. That is, he was beheaded. So, this is a short note on Jahangir. Now, moving to Nur Jahan. Jahangir married Nur Jahan in 1611. The original name of Nur Jahan is Meherun Nisha, that is the light of the world. And then in 1612, the next year what happened? Arjumant Banu Begum. She married the third son of Jahangir, Kurram, known to be the Shah Jahan. Some historians have said that Nur Jahan has organized a group called as Junta, that is military and political groups. And it was a closed confined group. And what happened? Shah Jahan, that is the son of Jahangir, rebelled against his father Jahangir in 1622 because he said that Nur Jahan has influenced Jahangir a lot and hence the rebellion. So after Jahangir's death in 1627, Shah Jahan moved to Agra and captured the throne. And then Nur Jahan was given pension until her death. So now coming to Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan ruled from 1627 to 1658. He protected the northwestern Frotriai with prolonged campaign because there was a lot of insecurities going in and around the northwestern Frotriai and hence for the prolonged campaign. 
and the deccan policy was also good that is the shah jahan's deccan policy was also good he captured the four mughal provinces that is he brought four deccan provinces under the mughals that is kandesh berar telangana and daulatabad was brought under the mughal provinces and these four places were given to aurangzeb to take care of and then the war of succession now coming to the war of succession under the shah jahan's period so the last years of shah jahan was under the succession that is all his sons started fighting for the throne he had four sons that is dara shikoi was the crown prince that is he is the eldest and then suja aurangzeb and murad baksh later what happened aurangzeb became the victorious among the four he fought against dara shikoi and captured agra and then shah jahan was put in the female apartment in his last years of his life and he was lovingly nursed by his daughter jahannara and in 1666 he died and he was buried near his wife in taj mahal now coming to aurangzeb the last ruler that is the last strongest ruler of the mughal empire he ruled from 1658 to 1707 he assumed the title alamgir that is alamgir means world conqueror and then his early conquest all were successful that is around 20 years all his conquest was successful but then when he came to the deccan the problem started later the jats the satnamis and the steeks started revolting against aurangzeb so coming to the deccan policy of aurangzeb which ruined aurangzeb the first thing the marathas under shivaji carved out the north and south konkan that is there is a konkan area right over here so the north and south of konkan was captured by the marathas so aurangzeb tried to invade bijapur and golconda so if you are coming to the south over here you have the bijapur and golconda in this region so he wanted to capture this region in order to in order to check the influence of the marathas so what he did he defeated shikandar shah of bijapur and he defeated the qutub shahi dynasty of the golconda and thus he captured which kingdom these bijapur and the golconda kingdom and then coming to the next point the destruction of the deccan kingdom was the political blunder of aurangzeb i'll tell you all why so they are telling this destruction that is the destruction of the bijapur and the golconda kingdom was a big blunder made by aurangzeb because he took away the barriers between the marathas and the mughals that is he removed this barrier that is he removed the gateway the mughals were here and the marathas were here what did aurangzeb do he took away the gateway from here and thereby accessing a direct control and then the deccan campaign exhausted the mughal treasury a lot of war happened in and around and hence the treasury of the mughal started coming down so according to jn sarkar he is telling the deccan ulcer ruined aurangzeb so aurangzeb actually started good policy when he came but later this deccan policy ruined aurangzeb he is telling this is an ulcer to aurangzeb now moving to the religious policy under aurangzeb aurangzeb was an orthodox muslim he enforced moral codes under high powered officer and that officer is called as muhtasib so that officer that is the high powered officer is called as what muhtasib he wanted to convert all the people under his reign to islamism and then the drinking was prohibited under his reign and the ban of drugs happened that is there was no bang or drugs to be intaken by the people astronomers and astrologers were dismissed from the court and then aurangzeb banned the construction of temples he even demolished some temples so he reimposed the jizya tax in 1679 we saw that akbar abolished the jizya tax and then it was reimposed by aurangzeb in 1679 moving to the celebration the celebration of muharram was stopped muharram is the birth day of prophet muhammad and then that day that is the celebration of muharram was stopped we already saw that aurangzeb invaded the deccan that deccan invasion is because of his hatred towards the shia faith that is a lot of people down in the deccan was following the shia faith and hence he disliked those people that's why he conducted a trial to the deccan and then he was against the sikhs and executed the ninth sikh guru teh bahadur so we already saw that guru arjun dev was executed now the ninth sikh guru that is teh bahadur was executed by whom aurangzeb 
and when rajputs and marathas turned enemies towards the mughals under the aurangzeb rule and then aurangzeb was responsible for the decline of mughals so who was responsible for the decline of the mughals aurangzeb was responsible for the decline of mughals and then coming to the character of aurangzeb though he followed a strict religious policy he was very disciplined and then he was simple in food and his dress he earned his personal income by copying quran and selling the copies that is he was well versed in the persian language and the writing and hence he copied the quran and started selling them that was his personal income and then he was a lover of books and his religious policy was not successful because he followed a strong orthodox policy and hence his religious policy was not successful and then moving to the last thing that is the causes for the decline of the mughal empire the first one is the mughal empire declined after the death of aurangzeb because he ruled for a very long period of time and his successors came into a very late age into the ruling part and nadir shah's invasion nadir shah is a person from afghan he invaded india and looted a lot of wealth from delhi in 1739 he took away the kohinoor diamond and the peacock throne from the mughal empire and then the religious and deccan policy of aurangzeb is considered to be a grave blunder and then after aurangzeb there were weak successors we already saw why the weak successors came in thus the decline was political economical and social so all the three aspects that is the political rule the economic rule and the social aspects caused the mughal empire to decline